you know, I find some really intelligent, interesting people who are doing what they can to do what they love, but you can't ignore the business side of it. And, and so they struggle with that. This is episode 95. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears and this is the show where we sit down with successful architects, designers, and consultants to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today we're joined by Todd Redding, the Chief Operations uh, Officer and Vice President for Investments for Charette Venture Group. I want to remind you that support for today's show is provided by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and product management software built specifically for architects. ArchiOffice is more affordable than you think, with a low monthly rate that won't break the bank for sole practitioners or small firm owners. And I was also told recently that you can get two seats free if you're a startup firm for a full year, which I think is kind of cool. So you can sign up for a demo over at ArchiOffice.com. Also, I want to give a big thanks to those of you who signed up for additional information on the 150015 project. Uh, That's my goal here on the Business of Architecture this year to impact measurably and positively positively the lives of 150 architects in 2015. So you can find out more about that. Sign up on that list to get the details at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash 150. The number is 150. And with that, I'd like to welcome Todd Redding to the show. Welcome, Todd. Hello, Enoch. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It is always my pleasure to have guests such as yourself on here, Todd, to come share your expertise, to share your knowledge, to share your background with a wide audience so we can learn from the things that you've learned and done in your life. So once again, thank you for coming on the show. Now, Todd, I mentioned that you are the the Chief Operating Officer of Charette Venture Group. Tell us what is Charette Venture Group. Yeah, well, uh, Shred Venture Group is an investment firm where uh, we focus on the small to mid-sized architecture firm space. The whole idea is to um, develop an investment model that can transform that small kind of four or five person firm and bring them uh, in a fairly short period of time to grow to a 10 or 15 person firm. Uh, And then we benefit from that from that growth. Do you have any idea at this stage, at this stage of your company, what those investments look like or maybe possible scenarios that you guys are thinking about? We're starting to get a better idea of that. Uh, We don't have any active investments at the moment. We're in the research kind of startup phase for our firm. And that startup phase really involves three three parts. The first part is our uh, architect business plan competition. Uh, this is our second year. I think you've, you've helped us with that effort some in the past and supported what we're doing. Uh, this year we had more than 100 firms uh, register for the competition, and they're now in the first phase of preparing their executive summary and a video uh, that they'll submit, and then we'll select finalists from that. So that, that immediately gives us an introduction to you know over 100 very entrepreneurial-minded uh, individuals who are thinking about the future of their firm, we get to learn from 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 that kind of exposure. And then the second piece is uh, we have an accelerator program, um, and uh, we have 21 firms that are participating in that. Every week they come together. We talk about a variety of topics from you know best practices, leadership, management, what some of their common challenges are, and we have guest speakers come in. Uh, for that as well. And uh, so that gives us kind of a deeper relationship with that audience. And then the third piece, uh, what you and I have talked about some is is my effort to go out and interview uh, at a minimum 100. I feel like it'll probably be more in the two to 300 range, but 100 uh, s- uh, small and mid-sized firms all over the United States, Canada, and the UK. And those interviews are simply an opportunity for me to listen to the history of that firm, the experiences of those architects, and see if I can start to form a base of knowledge that we can use to really drive uh, drive our eventual uh, investment model. And what kind of experience do you have in the AEC industry? Is this fairly new to you, Todd? Yeah, for me, it's, it's very new. Um, I did spend six years running a, a manufacturing company that, that worked deeply with architects, but uh, I have not don't have any training in that field. I'm a business guy. Um, 
entrepreneur. I've started and run companies, but um, this is my first time to dive really deeply into uh, into architecture. So do you remember some of the first thoughts that you were having as you were starting to get exposed to this industry, you know, from your outside perspective? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, well, first of all, I like the industry a lot. I mean, I, I always like design. I live in a house that's 115 years old. Uh, you know, I, I've always kind of marveled at, uh, at the aspect of I can of see it behind you. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's, uh, it's, it, it's in Iowa, and uh, my, my windows are 115 years old, too. So <laughs> <laughs> you feel the breeze practically coming through, and you may hear a clanking of the radiators in the background. But you know, I, I really am interested in that in that area. It all has kind of always been a part of me, and and uh, and then to apply my business background um, to to the space has been you know really interesting. So I've had an opportunity to get get to know some really interesting people who I think have some very profound needs um, and some you know some uh, opportunities, as I think you you have uh, recognized by creating your business, some opportunities to help people run better businesses. So, and then the kind of the, the outsider perspective, any, you know, kind of things where you thought, wow, this is interesting that they do it this way, or wow, this is really different from the way it is in this industry or other businesses I've looked at. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it is. Uh, I can say that there's this interesting uh, dynamic going on in that small uh, architecture firm space where many people have told me that they were ill-equipped to run a business you know coming out of architecture school and they underestimated what it would take to run a business and they struggle with uh, what to do you know where they are and I had one gentleman who was really interesting he, he's running a, a small firm he's being very successful but I asked him I said did you have any business classes uh, when you were in architecture school to kind of help prepare you for running this this small business and he said, no, Todd, you, you don't understand. I actively avoided anything that had anything to do with business. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had anybody tell me that before because I've never, you know, kind of never been in that world. And so, you know, I find some really intelligent, interesting people who are doing what they can to do what they love, um, but you can't ignore the business side of it. And, and so they struggle with that. So I've watched a, a lot of different firms address that in different ways. Some of them, in my opinion, good, and some of them uh, probably not so good. So you know, that's been an interesting dynamic for me to see uh, that I had not expected. Fascinating. Can you give us some examples of, first of all, some of the not so good examples, and then perhaps some of the good examples? Yeah, yeah, I, I will. And I, I, I hope no, none of your listeners take any offense to this, because I don't think any any of the perhaps uh, bad is the wrong word. Let's call them maybe less than optimal ways of running a business. They're not. They're certainly not people that you know are malicious or are doing anything to intentionally uh, do the wrong thing. They just perhaps didn't know better, and and they're doing it the best way they, they feel they have. So, so there's this one dynamic that that it seems to come up about how you engage younger architects in your firm, and it looks like there's two at least two paradigms that I see. The first is a paradigm where the, the primary leader um, is perhaps a little paranoid about sharing their financials, sharing uh, you know the, the inner workings of their firm with the younger architects because you know they may have had experiences in the past where architects left and took business with them and started a competing firm or for whatever reason you know they've had some some bad experiences and they think that the way to shield themselves and reduce turnover inside their growing firm is to really kind of have this very closed view. And then the second paradigm is the exact opposite. I mean, it's people that were uh, typically people that were mentored in a larger firm that had a culture of transparency and open book. And, and one, one gentleman told me that the firm that he really kind of grew up in uh, believed in, in educating every employee of how to run a business. They believed everybody should know how to run the business. It was very uh, transparent. And, and there's this, this um, perception of, among group one that that's going to reduce turnover. And I would, I would predict, uh, based on my interviews, that the turnover is actually double in the firms that think that they're, uh, you know, that they're protecting themselves from that than it is from the very transparent firms. The transparent firms seem 
to be where people feel like they're a part of the operation, uh, part of the family. Um, they feel it's more honest and more engaging. And so uh, I, would, I would encourage firms to consider the latter rather than the former. Which one do you find to be more prevalent, just in your small sample size? Yeah, it's 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 probably the former. Um, it, it's uh, it's the more closed kind of uh, mentality. Although although I will say that you know um, it has a lot to do with the age of the firm, the age of the partners. Um, I asked one gentleman. I remember a conversation where I said, "Where do you think?" you know, the the kind of the plateau point is for that small firm, where do they get to a point where they really need that outside help to, you know, cross the chasm, so to speak, to the next level? And he had a very interesting answer. He said, it all depends on how the firm started, that if the firm started from kind of an implosion of other firms and partners from, from different firms with a lot of years of experience come together and create this equal partnership, that that firm has a very different growth cycle than if you have someone with maybe five or six years of experience in a larger firm and they decide to go out and start it on their own uh, has a very different trajectory. So, um, And what are those two different tra trajectories? Yeah, they're more ready. I think they're more ready for that, um, that uh, Crossing the chasm is what I like to call it. Um, to, to, you know, to take take Malcolm Gladwell's term, but um, it, they started on their own and they've kind of built it up to a point where they have four or five people with them. It has a very clear culture, a very clear vision, and they've kind of plateaued now where they're going to need to really address some key questions to move to that next level. Um, the first one being is: Are we going to be intentional about growth? Um, there is in, among the groups that I've interviewed. There is a, a fairly strong group inside there that, that aren't sure about the answer to that question. They, uh, they say they want to grow to six, seven, eight architects, but they don't really have a, an intentional plan of where their revenue should be, uh, what their cost structure is going to be like, what they're going to invest some of that, uh, those, that, those monies in to tell, help build them up to that point. So I think they've got to be intentional about growth, and I see that more in the firms that were started by one or two uh, perhaps younger, less experienced architects um, than the ones that are coming from other more mature partnerships, uh, that more intentional focus on growth. And the second thing is that they, they understand at that, again, that four or five person level that in order to move forward, they've got to find an answer to operations. They know that bookkeeping and you know payroll uh, HR policies standard processes they know that these things need to be done and they're really looking for ways to try to get those critical pieces done and managed without necessarily consuming all of one or two partners time um, so that's that's the other piece I guess the third piece I would say is um, the ones that are really ready to, again, cross that chasm are the ones who embrace marketing and they embrace business development as a part of their daily lives. They, uh, they really understand that in order to grow the firm, they cannot sit back and just kind of take the work as it comes in because that's going to ebb and flow. They've got to develop a, a consistent um, and somewhat strong you know, marketing plan, uh, and they understand that. So you mentioned that the firms which, and I'm just going to rephrase to make sure I have it right, uh, you're finding that the firms who have more experienced principals who are more mature tend to be generally more intentional about their growth. I think generally that's, that's what I've found. Um, well, they have strengths as well. Um, they have, they have uh, the more mature firms, the more mature partnerships seem to have, uh, you know, they, they certainly understand the design world much better. They come to the table with a stronger portfolio. Uh, their networks are stronger. So, I mean, they have a lot of strengths that are, are powerful. Um, I do find a number of those firms tend to be, um, you know, uh, uh, more satisfied with where they are, I think. Mm -hmm. That might be, might be a good way of saying it. Okay. Hey, let's circle back and talk a little bit about transparency or dealing with younger architects or nurturing people because you mentioned that that was something that firms struggle with. Uh, fortunately, yes. in, in my career, my mentors have been very open with the books and sharing, etc. But have you come across any best practices for how, I, I mean, I can personally identify with principals or business owners that feel hesitant 
you know, to reveal intercompany information. You know, maybe someone's going to be disgruntled about not getting paid too much when they see how much they're being billed out for. But of course, right. they don't understand all the overhead that goes into running a practice. So I kind of get that fear. What would you say to principals that maybe recognize that they're on the side of they want to share more, they want to be more transparent, they're not quite sure how to do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I want to be very careful about how I answer it because I, I don't want to give the impression that I have a, a, um, um, an exact formula that you have to follow to create this culture of engagement. I think um, the most important thing is that you acknowledge that that's the culture you want to create, that's what you want to nurture, and then you work hard to find ways to do that inside your own firm. And every person's going to have a different comfort level about you know, what what they're comfortable sharing as an owner and what they're not. And and I'm not sure there's any exact right or wrong answer that works for everyone across the board. Um, but having said that, I would, I would say that, you know, uh, every employee wants to feel like they're making a difference, particularly in this design community where I hear things like, you know, I didn't get into this for the money. Uh, I want to change the world. Um, I asked one firm what their growth strategy was, and, and their answer was that they want to do 20% of their work pro bono and for nonprofits, and I said, no, no. I asked you what, what your growth strategy was. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there is this very kind of philanthropic culture in, inside this community, and um, and so I think you know it's very important to recognize that and to recognize that that other people in your firm want to feel a part of what's going on, and and feeling a part of what's going on is seeing some of the inner workings of the business, um, and that may not be necessarily the exact P and L uh, every month. Uh, but it's certainly a discussion uh, at some periodic time, I would say no less than uh, quarterly, with the employees where you sit around the table and you talk about the business, you talk about where you're making money, where you're not making money, you have concerns about expenses, you talk about that as an owner so everybody understands that you're concerned about that. Um, so, uh, and, and I think you also need to have some pretty well-defined revenue goals and everybody understands what those goals are so that they're feeling like they're helping you uh, achieve those. And that, you know, those are just some, some ba very basic ideas about how to develop those cult that culture. But um, I don't think you can deny that building a culture of engagement and involvement um, is critical to a, to a healthy business. Okay. And then some of the benefits, you mentioned one of them was a lower turnover rate of having that kind of culture. Any other benefits? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the research on, on the broader business level outside of just the architectural community shows that employees are more productive when they feel like they're a part of the organization and they feel they have a say in the organization. Um, you also see productivity numbers go up when, when people feel happy, right? They're just generally the stress level in their life is, is lower and, uh, you know, they feel like they're a part of an organization that cares about them. Productivity numbers go up. Um, so I, you know, I think that uh, the benefits are are uh, are vast in terms of, of building that that culture of involvement. In terms of your business background and your previous experience, are there any resources that you could direct people to that are listening to learn more about best practices in terms of you know encouraging engagement, encouraging loyalty, and a sense of being part of the company? Yeah, um, I mean, there's certainly some some books. I mean, everyone I think has probably heard of Jim Collins and the, the legendary business book Good to Great. Um, that that book, in my mind, was just a, a phenomenal examination of things that work and best practices inside organizations that can definitely apply to the architectural community. Um, there, uh, one of my other favorites is Stephen Covey's Principal Centered Leadership. Um, if you want to read a really good book that talks about how you interact with people around you, uh, that's that's one of the best. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, when it comes to processes and efficiency, uh, anything you can learn about the lean movement, uh, the lean startup is a great book that applies more to the technology sector. Um, but um, consistently improving efficiencies and process improvement uh, are all good topics to read about and try to apply those practices to your architectural firm. Have you ever come across the book I Power by uh, Marty Edelston? I've heard of that book, but I have not read it. Okay. Curious. So I just picked it up the other day. I just mentioned it because you were talking about the continuous improvement, and I thought he had some interesting things that he was doing in his company, you know, a long, long time ago to kind of do that. So, yeah, so have, you, have you finished the book yet? No, I haven't. You just... Mm -mm. Just got it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sitting with all my other business books that are just there on the right. shelf to look beautiful. Right. My right. wife makes yeah. fun of me, yeah. 
stacks. Yeah, I, I, I tend to have the same kinds of stacks, and most of them are about three quarters of the way red. <laughs> exactly. Well, Todd, were there, so we talked about um, some of the challenges that you're finding as you talk with architecture firms is the challenge of engagement and engaging the younger staff and creating that, that firm culture. Uh, what other challenges are you seeing? You know, certainly that, to go back to that operational challenge of what do you do when you're at that four or five person firm and everybody is doing a little bit of everything. And I hear a lot of common stories about long work hours and not totally having their arms around the numbers and trying to figure out how to move from that point to the next point. And, um, you know, some uh, some firms are more comfortable with outsourcing their bookkeeping functions. And I've talked to a number of folks that uh, have a, an off-site kind of virtual bookkeeper that does the billing, uh, does the, uh, the payroll and handles most of the, the financial, you know, entry of the data and then just producing reports. Um, most firms... It's not uncommon, certainly for them to have a CPA that's helping with tax reporting, but that day-to-day -day financial management piece is uh, something I think the successful firms are finding an answer to that question of how do they get that off their plate, because at that point the partners have more projects that they need to kind of be involved in, they need to be more active in mentoring some of those younger employees, and they don't necessarily have the revenues to afford a full-time you know, CFO. Uh, some uh, one firm that I talked to is doing a very good job with a, a remote bookkeeper, and they've set up a file sharing system on Cubby.com. They preferred Cubby over uh, Google Drive just because of the way the folders were sorted and and dated and so forth. But they've developed a system for you know as the work is is uh, produced, it's put into client folders online, and the bookkeeper pulls that information down out of the cloud and then processes the invoices and. Uh, and updates their uh, their online version of QuickBooks. So those are some you know those are excellent ways to try to inexpensively overcome this issue of how do I get these operational tasks off my off my plate. Others are trying to look to the interns to um, to help with marketing and social media. I see varying levels of success in that area, and some of that is my own opinion about. Uh, social media marketing, and some of it is, you know, is that they they hire uh, interns who are really interested in architecture, and then kind of give them the assignment of managing their Facebook account, <laughs> and they're, you know, that's not that's not what they got in this for. So uh, we see a little bit of that activity, but I would encourage firms to be, you know, really intentional with your marketing uh, program, and you know, the the trick about things like social media and developing a website and a blog is that. You know, you really, it's not, you, you, don't, you don't build it and then just walk away. These are very interactive, uh, alive mechanisms that have to be tested, fine-tuned. Um, I, ta I talked with a, a friend yesterday who has a franchise, and they were considering hiring an intern to manage their Facebook account. And uh, they had data um, that they had produced over the last year over what ads worked better and what, you know, what ads didn't, what ads uh, converted more customers to actually sign up for their services and what didn't. And, and so, you know, they were really struggling with this idea of it's going to take three months for an intern to even understand what this, what this data means and what our brand means, and what our services are. And so, you know, they were struggling with, do they hire someone professionally to manage their social media accounts? And my advice was, you, you've got to do that because you'll, you'll, spend a lot of time trying to bring someone into your brand that doesn't understand the way all of this works. And in the end, that'll cost you. So I think you got to recognize that your marketing program is a is an alive uh, thing that needs constant attention and constant time. Could you give me some examples of what it would mean to be intentional about a a marketing program? Sure. I mean, the first question is, do you have a marketing plan? Do you have a you know have you sat down and really thought through? Um, you know, the next year of what what your brand means to your customers, what value you're really bringing to the table. Have you articulated that? Um, and then have you looked for what markets you're going after? You know, are you, are you going to continue to focus on a specialized part of the market or are you trying to broaden that portfolio so you have a lot of different capabilities? Um, and that's what I mean by being intentional is that you're not just sitting down kind of doing the work every day. You're you're really taking some time out to to write this out and have a very intentional, well-defined strategy, and then fact, you know define how your website fits into that, how your 
um, the way you answer the phone can affect whether you know can affect that. Um, how how you know, so? You, well, you know, we we see this uh, all the time. I'll tell you a story about um, a hospital that I know that had very very low uh, patient satisfaction scores, and um, for several years they built a new wing onto their hospital, and they renovated this. They had this big fountain in the lobby. And uh, they were really excited to open this new wing because they really felt like that was going to answer these low patient satisfactory scores. And uh, what they found six months into it was the scores actually went, went way down. And the scores went down because people walked into this beautiful atrium and this brand new wing and the expectation of the patient experience elevated, right? They thought they were going to get a five-star treatment. And they hadn't done anything to change the culture or change the processes or change the way they were providing their services, they just thought that the, you know, the construction was going to solve the problem. And so you, everything that you do has to be consistent with your brand experience. If you're going to tell customers that you have a very, um, a very high attention level to the relationship that you have with your customers, then when the person calls your office phone, they can't get a busy signal or they can't get somebody who doesn't have the time to talk to them. Um, it all needs to flow and be consistent. Um, every architecture firm that I've talked to has told me this is a relationship business. Well, if that's true, then you really should be spending some time thinking about in your marketing plan, how are you communicating that? How are you communicating that you value that relationship and that you'll be there with that client? Um, the other thing about the architecture space that I found really interesting is just the percentage of business that is referral-based and recurring-based, right? I haven't had anybody say, 90% of our business is all new business, right? <laughs> I mean, it's everyone says it's relationship, it's referral, and it's recurring. Well, that's I, I think that's wonderful to hear, uh, but that even heightens the importance of that, you know, that intentional approach to how you're telling the world about your firm even more because it's intimate. It's it's a deep relationship-based, uh, well, you know, transaction. So. Uh, I guess that's a long answer to how do you keep it intentional. It just needs to be intentional. It needs to be consistent. And uh, the messaging that you're sending needs to carry through everything that you do. Todd, I think it's a good a good point to to break the conversation right now and just end up by asking you what business sort of resources are you looking at right now and learning from in your own personal life? Hmm, that's a great question. Well, so I'll tell you one is I teach a night class at the University of Iowa on e-commerce and entrepreneurial strategies. Mm -hmm. And um, it, might, it might seem contradictory to answer your question of what, what do you learn from to answer it by I'm teaching. But the reality is, is teaching that course has taught me uh, more about entrepreneurialism than I, than I thought I ever would learn in that experience. The way the students are asking questions, the ideas that they come to. Uh, so that has been a phenomenal experience. I listen to business radio on uh, on Sirius Satellite Radio and and love it. It's done through the Wharton Business School, um, and uh, you know I, I am involved in a number of startup conversations, dialogues, panels, and so forth that I seem to learn from every every time I get. And it, it, even in exchanges like this, seem to always teach me a thing or two. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.